Welcome to the September meeting of the Dallas branch of ASCE. I'd like to extend a welcome to all of our members and guests. I'll now give you a few branch announcements. If you want to do more than just attend the meetings or have ideas on how we can better our branch, then we would love to have you help us plan what we can accomplish as a branch by joining our team. The nominations are out for all committee positions for the 2020 your 2021 year. See the website for the application. Nomination forms for committee and institute positions should be completed and emailed ASAP. Just as a reminder, if you have not voted in the ASCE Dallas branch election, the online voting is open until 10 minutes before the end of this meeting. So you can vote until 1250 online at the link below. Normally we would have written ballots for you, but that's not available this year. The voting results will be presented to members via a video message posted on the Dallas branch YouTube channel on September 18th, as well as emailed out. The recommended slate of candidates for the year of 2020 through 2021 for ASCE Dallas Branch Board of Directors are as followed. Vice President Nancy Klein, Secretary Reese Taylor, Treasurer Patrick Williams, Technical Director Surya Bandari, Branch Director Nicholas Phillips. The succession of officers for the 2020 through 2021 Board of Directors in accordance with the ASCE Dallas Branch Rules of Operation Bylaws are President Jonathan Brower, who is seceding from President-elect, President elect Ed Penton, who is seceding from vice president, past president Julie Jones, who is seceding from president, Texas section director Philip Alcorn, who will be completed his second year of a two-year term. The October Dallas branch meeting is the annual meeting of the Dallas branch and elected officials will be installed at that meeting. I now have a few other Dallas branch and Texas section announcements. The Dallas branch is considering starting both the Architectural Engineering Institute AEI, and Utility Engineering and Surveying Institute, UESI, in the Dallas branch. If you are interested in helping to start those institutes, please let us know at info at dallasasce.org. CECON will be going virtual this year. It will occur November 4th from through 6th, and the theme will be Envision the Future. More information will be sent out as the sessions are finalized. Texas section is seeking nominations for the following positions, President-Elect, Vice President for Technical Affairs-Elect, Vice President for Educational Affairs-Elect, Vice President for Professional Affairs-Elect, and First Year Director at Large. Nominations are due by October 31st, and more information can be found on the Texas section website. Another final announcement is the golf tournament that was gonna be hosted by the Fort Worth branch will not be held this year because of COVID restrictions. We'll now be going on with the main speaker. If you have any comments or questions during the presentation, you can type them in the chat to the right of the presentation. For today's presentation, we have Edward Motley, Lake Ralph Hall Program Manager for the Upper Trinity Regional Water District. He'll be giving a presentation entitled Writing the Great American Novel, Developing a Water Supply, Lake Ralph Hall. Ed is a graduate of the University of Texas Arlington with both a bachelor's and master's degree in civil engineering. He has practiced engineering for over 43 years, taking on roles from construction engineer, design engineer, project manager, to executive leadership. Ed spent most of his career in the consulting engineering business and only recently joined the Upper Trinity Regional Water District as program manager of the Lake Ralph Hall project. Ed has been a member of ASCE since 1976. On a personal note, he's been married to his wife, Linda, for 42 years and has two sons and five grandchildren. And I'll turn it over to Ed to let us know a little bit more about the Lake Grove Hall project. Okay, well, well thank you. It's, I'm, I'm very excited about being able to present to ASCE today. This is actually in, in my all my years of being a member of ASCE, this is the first time that I've been had the opportunity or the privilege of support of presenting to the Dallas branch. So uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. So I've titled my project, Writing the Great American Novel, because I can tell you uh, by personal experience, and as you can see some things that I'm gonna present later today, that building a new water supply is a lot, of, a lot like writing, writing the Great American Novel. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of fortitude, a lot of patience. Uh, so, but anyway, let's get right on started. So how do you write a novel? Uh, you do it one chapter at a time. So how do you build a water supply reservoir? One step at a time. So I've structured my presentation today as, as the chapters of my book, or, and, and this is a, uh, it's almost as long as Gone with the Wind, but not quite. 
Uh, but the, the chapters are the beginning, the planning, the regulatory approvals, then going from that plan to a reality, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about what uh, kind of a kind of an epilogue, uh, what happens after the project is complete. I wanna introduce you to a few people here, is the two gentlemen there on the uh, photograph on the top there, is the one on the left is Ralph Hall. And the gentleman on the right is Leon Hurst. And as you'll hear later on, the, the, it's obviously the Lake Ralph Hall Dam or the Lake Ralph Hall Project, but the dam is named after uh, Leon Hurst. Leon is a longtime mayor of Ladonia, and Lake Ralph Hall was originally his and several of his cohorts in, uh, in, in Ladonia, their vision. And they reached out to Ralph Hall to help them move this project forward. The two gentlemen on the bottom, again, is Ralph Hall on the left, and the one on the right is Tom Taylor, who's the longtime executive director, uh, the founding direct, executive director of Upper Trinity Regional Water District. Before that, he was the city of Dallas. Whoops, what happened there? He was the city of Dallas uh, water director. And it's Tom Taylor's, a lot of his vision that actually got us through this project. Oh, he's, he's guided this project from the very beginning and uh, until he just recently retired about a year ago from Upper Trinity. So the beginning, aligning a water supply to the available resources. So a little bit about Upper Trinity, uh, the district was created by the legislature in 1989 uh, under Article 16, Section 59 of the Constitution, and we are authorized to provide its me our members and customers with water supply, wastewater, and solid waste. We started out in 1989 with no customers, no contracts, no water, no wastewater, and we now uh, are serving all of these cities. Uh, I think there's about 30 of them there uh, that are our members and customers. Our service area is primarily Denton County, north of Denton Creek. We also extend into Wise County, a little bit into Cook County. Uh, we have a couple of customers in North Western Collin County and the very bottom of Grayson County. City of Irving there is a member but not a customer, uh, but very much of a partner in this project and a partner in a lot of other things that we do. Back, uh, this whole project kind of started with, or, or water supply started with Upper Trinity when I was retained at, well, working in the consulting industry to work with Mr. Taylor to develop a long range water supply for the district. And during his years in, in the city of Dallas water director, he observed how, he called it the bow wave of development, is how the, 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 the edge of development just kept creeping further and further north. And if you look there on the left, you see that was that red line constituted about the upper limits of, of development in 1984. On the right there, you see where the, that is in 2016, which is the latest Google Earth picture I could find that would cover it up. You see how far it's progressed all the way out to Denton, up along State uh, uh, Highway 380, and it's continuing progressing up. And most of, a good part of that area where it's covered is Upper Trinity service area. So what does that look like in terms of water supply? This is the graph that we actually produced way back in 2000. And you see there that we had water supply, we had the Chapman contract at the very bottom, we had a contract with Dallas. And then, and then some of our customers had water supplied by others, either their own wells or their own contracts with Dallas or Denton or other suppliers. And then we had reuse on top of that, but that gave us, that demonstrated that we were gonna have a shortfall in about 2025. And our current projections still hold that 2025 is where about where that crosses. We have a shortfall in, 20, in 2060 of about 61 million gallons per day. And that, and that makes the assumption of savings of about 10 million gallons per day from uh, conservation. So we had a need for water. About that time, city of Ladonia, Mayor Hurst reached out to me through another individual and said that, hey, we understand you're looking for water. We'd like to build a reservoir here north of Ladonia. And their goals were for economic development. They wanted to secure their own long-term water supply. And they basically wanted to save their town from the decline. They had no employment base and, they, and their vision was is that a lake would bring economic, more people to town, economic development, and save their town from its continued decline. 
At the same time, Upper Trinity's goals was to have a reliable water supply that they own. All of their supplies were through contracts and they wanted to actually control a part of their water supply through permits. Uh, they wanted a project that could easily be permitted and meet regulatory requirements and they wanted one with local support. So with that, a partnership was created between Upper Trinity and Ladonia and that partnership is still continuing today. So we had a project uh, or we knew what we had a plan, so we need or we need to plan for our project. So now we, we had a project, we need to plan it. So we had to formulate a vision for what that future water supply would be. So first question is why build a reservoir on the North Sulphur River? And you see there is this line here constitutes the North Sulphur River today. It was originally meandering like this right here, but back in the 1920s and 30s, there was a basically a flood control project that would dig that dug a ditch and straightened it out and that ditch looked something like this it was about 20 feet wide and 10 feet deep which is this little notch right here over because they straightened up the channel they basically tripled the, the slope of the gradient and created a, a high erosion uh, potential so that channel today is about 200 feet wide in about 60 feet deep. And to give you a visual of what that looks like is this is a picture at the State Highway 34 bridge and it just gives you a sense of the scale. Is here you see two people and this is the North Sulphur River as it is today. Okay, the, uh, and why is that mechanism working is I, talk, I talked about the gradient, but the, the bedrock there is, is a shell layer that is highly weatherable. And so every time it, a new, layer of shell is exposed, it weathers up and basically creates these little bitty cobbles, almost gravel sized cobbles. And then when the next flood comes through, it washes it all away. This channel today is, is big enough, broad enough and deep enough that it conveys the 100 year flood totally within the limits of the channel. And also since the channel has down cut so much and lowered the gradient is the tributaries as you see here on the right uh, are also head, they have head cutting on the tributaries. All of this erosion you see right here on this part of it is, was actually done on one storm event over a weekend. So it, it, the, the project is basically a ecological disaster, so, but it's also a great place for a reservoir. So we looked at four different dam configurations. The most upstream dam A was the project that the city envisioned, but that really didn't provide enough water for the district. So we looked at four other, at, at, at uh, four, uh, three other configurations to see which one would be the best one for the district. And we came up with, here you see the different sizes. Uh, dam A is the one the city uh, looked at, but the, the the one that the district kind of focused in on was Dam C uh, because basically it was big enough, but not too big. It provided us with 34,000 acre feet and we anticipate that we'll get reuse of the water that we import, which would give us another uh, probably 50%. So that'd be 17,000 acre feet. So that would give us about 50,000 acre feet, which is a big chunk of that 61,000 acre feet. And we can find other resources in the future to fill that, that other need. So we also had to get the water from Ralph Hall to the district. Our water treat, our most, our primary water treatment plant is the Taylor plant, which is down here at the end of Lake Louisville next to the dam. We also have the Harpool plant, which is up here next to Providence Village on 380. We looked at five alignments that would get the water from Ralph Hall directly to to Harpool. We also looked at four alignments that would connect the, pro the project to the existing Irving Chapman pipeline you see right here in, the, uh, in this kind of brown uh, dash line. And after all the evaluation with our preferred alignment is this red alignment which we have further refined and using the Irving pipeline and the capacity in that one. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So now we had a project. We knew what we were gonna build. Uh, so we had to get a permits and approvals. The two primary permits were the section 404 permit from the US Army Corps of Engineers and a permit to appropriate state water from the, from the TCEQ. But to 
gain approval of those permits, we had to address all of these other laws and rules that uh, uh, were required, that were prerequisites of get, primarily getting the 404 permit. So the water rights permitting process is illustrated on this graphic. And we started out, we submitted our application in September of 2003. And after administrative complete uh, in 2004, the, and then their technical reviews, the TCQ issued a draft, uh, of the, the actual the final draft permit in June of 2011. Uh, we had, our permit was contested by the Town of Flower Mound, as well as the National Wildlife Federation and Texas Committee on Natural Resources. So we had to go to an administrative law hearing, which was actually held in, in January of, there were, from, from April of 12 until January 13 was the, all of the discovery in pretrial that the trial was actually held in January 15th through 25th of 2013. The trial judges issued a decision. The TCQ affirmed that decision and issued a draft permit and a final permit was issued and approved by TCQ on December 11th of 2013. So that was 10 years, almost 10 years, a little over 10 years to get our water rights permit. The 404 permit, we filed an application in 2006, and we actually uh, started our, our interface with them in 2003, and our project has a core project number of 2003. And we we're actually, that any of the laws in effect, in 20, rules and laws in effect in 2013 were the ones that we uh, had to fall under. <clears throat> we, and at the end in 2008, uh, the Corps decided that we would have to have an environmental impact statement, so we initiated that in December of 2018. Finally, in October of 2018, the Corps issued a draft environmental impact statement and held a public comment and a public hearing. Then in September of 2019, almost a year later, they issued the final environmental impact statement. And finally, in January of 20, this last January of 2020, they issued a record of decision and a permit. So that took uh, the better part of uh, 14 years to get the, the 404 permit. So you would think that we were done, but in getting the 404 permit, uh, in developing the mitigation plan primarily, we had to work with all of these agencies. And we were meeting with these agencies every month for about a year and a half in negotiating the plan. We've spent literally uh, probably dozens of hours together negotiating the details of our mitigation plan, uh, which were, was a prerequisite of getting our permit approved. But again, it was approved. Here you see on the left, Larry Patterson in the middle signing the permit. I'm standing there on his left and Ronald Hart, our uh, water resources manager on his right. And this picture here on the, on the right is Larry Patterson with, Ms. with Congressman Hall a few years ago at his office in Washington, DC. So you would think we're done with, with the, <coughs> excuse me, regulatory agencies, but we're not. Our permit requires that we comply with a programmatic agreement relative to cultural resources. We, uh, as, as a condition of our permit, we enter a program, programmatic agreement with the Corps of Engineers, the Te Te Texas Historical Commission, as well as uh, a number of, uh, uh, actually three tribes were also uh, correspondents to that. They're actually not signatories, but they're, they wanna be corresponded with. So we had to complete a comprehensive survey of the reservoir area, which includes over 150 trenches, like the one you see here on your left. Uh, these trenches are about about 10 feet deep, 10 to 12 feet deep, uh, 15 feet long, and as wide as they need to be to be a safe trench. And what we're doing is we're mapping the stratigraphy and looking for any artifacts that may, we may be found uh, buried. And what they're looking for is prehistoric archeological resources. 
On top of that, we have to do shovel test transects for the res for entire reservoir area that constitutes about 8,500 acres. The, uh, <clears throat> and these are uh, a test, a, a shovel test about every 100 meters on a 50 meter grid, on a 50 meter uh, uh, interval, uh, and basically digging a hole about uh, six inches deep and a meter wide looking for, again, art surface artifacts. We also had to do a view shed analysis of structures within one mile of the shoreline to make sure that our shore, we weren't changing the views of any historic structures. Once we complete all of that, if there's any of these that appear to be eligible for listing on the National Historic Register, we'll have to do additional testing to quantify that. We do have to move portions of one cemetery. Uh, there's about a handful of graves that are within the uh, on the edge of the 100 year floodplain that we're having to move. And if any of these resources are, are turn out to be eligible, we have to mitigate that and do some additional uh, recovery of those artifacts. So this is ongoing and it's actually the one thing that's in the way of construction right now is finishing these, uh, these surveys. Uh, we also have to develop a programmatic plan to protect any paleontological artifacts that we uncover. The North Sulphur River is a, uh, uh, known to be a place where uh, fossil hunters always go and, uh, and find all sorts of prehistoric dinosaur type uh, bones and such. So we have a permit. Now we'll be going from plan to reality and that's designing and building the new water supply. So the components of Lake Ralph Hall are the Leon Hurst Dam and Spillway, uh, and I'll go through each one of these in more detail in a minute, uh, relocation of roadways and bridges, clearing and demolition within the re reservoir footprint, aquatic mitigation in those three kind of brown areas, uh, support facilities, which I'll talk about. We have our conveyance, and we also have support, the program support. And all is about uh, uh, 489 million and, and estimated cost that is that includes permitting land as well as construction. We'll have to ex execute over 50 contracts and agreements, coordinate with more than 10 state, federal, local agencies, and interact with a number of other stakeholders, including Encore to relocate a power line, Fannin County Electrical Cooperative to re relocate a power line, a couple of water supply corporations, and AT AT and T for a fiber optic cable. The raw water conveyance it has a raw water pump station just below the dam, about 32 miles of raw water pipeline, a new balancing reservoir, and a connection into the Irving Chapman pipeline. So the Leon Hurst Dam, it has an embankment length of about 2.32 miles of maximum height of 103 feet. The top width is 20 feet, about 3 million yards of earth fill. The spillway, which I'll show you in a minute, is about 125,000 yards of roller compacted concrete. And it also includes about 7,500 yards of, of concrete. So the, 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 the service spillway is right here and it conveys the 100 year flood and routes it into the north, existing North Sulphur River Channel. This area here is the emergency spillway which engages at the 100 year flood and conveys the, the bulk of the floodwaters above the 100 year flood and it discharges into Baker Creek, which has a confluence with the North Sulphur River about two miles downstream of the dam. The service spillway, here's a few uh, uh, renderings of it. It has a, a, a labyrinth weir, which allows us to get more weir length over the same length of dam. It is designed to hold a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, conservation pool of 551, and so there's one one pass of, or, or one pass of this is engages at 551. The rest engages at 553, and what that allows us to do is to basically hold back some floodwaters or some stormwaters because it, it takes it a, from 553 to 551. It takes it about a month to evacuate that from the from the reservoir. 
But anything over 553, it takes it about a day or two to evacuate. So it, it's a very efficient spillway. Uh, and also allows us to capture, to, to capture a little bit of extra water. On the downstream face, we have our two pipes that come out and go to our pump station. We also have over here in the right hand corner, a couple of pipes that allow us to discharge into the North Suffolk River and have some, some managed flows. The gate structure for the intake is right here over, uh, and this, it, it has two sets of four gates at different elevations to allow us to selectively withdraw water and, and go into these two outlet pipes. So that's a little bit of sense for what the, what the spillway looks like. The dam embankment, uh, the anatomy of that is, <clears throat> we have a overburden of clay, and then on that sits on top of a shell bedrock. So the upstream face is a random clay with the armoring along the uh, upward, upward face for wave erosion is a, sand, a soil cement, which is basically a lean sand cement mixture that's placed rel relatively dry. <clears throat> we have the random fill. We have a chimney drain that would intercept any seepage that would go through there and relieve any, any hydraulic uh, pressures on the downstream face of the dam and make that more stable. So we have the chimney drain that discharges into a blanket drain that goes out into the atmosphere. We have more random fill. And then just to make the, for the stability of the downstream face, we have a CL clay material that will be placed on the, on, the, on the upper portion of that. All of the clay material will be mined on site. All of the sand material for the blanket drain and chimney drain has to be imported. <clears throat> We also have a slurry trench, bent not slurry trench, that basically is a cutoff between the existing ground and goes to the overburden and keys into the shell. Uh, the top of the reservoir, the top of the dam is at 566, which is that gives us a three foot free board over the probable maximum flood. And as you see here, the, the normal water surface or the, the uh, conservation pool elevation is 551. The roads and bridges, uh, we're relocating about 2.7 miles of FM 50, 1550, and that's just a roadway relocation, a surface roadway. State, State Highway 34, we have about three miles of that, about 6,000 feet is a bridge over the North Sulphur River, and about 600 feet is a bridge over Merrill Creek, with the total width of those bridges being about 61 feet. We're also terminating or relocating or even improving some parts of 10 county roads. So what does that look like is FM 1550 will be aligned along this, this yellow road up here, these two existing county roads. We're changing the, the geometry a little bit to make it more of a county road, 45 mile an hour road. Uh, and we're doing that because this section of 1550 will be uh, abandoned. Uh, and then this section right next to it, the next 34 will be turned over to county maintenance. The red line here is State Highway 34, which will be, we'll be building the bridges just to the west or upstream face, and allows us to do complete construction while maintaining traffic on the existing. FM 2990, which is this gray area here, will be abandoned uh, with the orange pieces uh, this outside of it being turned over to the county for county maintenance. The purple areas are county roads that will be abandoned. Uh, this little section of County Road right here will be improved as well as 36, uh, 45 down here. So that's basically our roadway improvements. The aquatic mitigation is we are restoring or enhancing 52 miles of stream, including ephemeral and intermittent streams. And basically we're going through and restabilizing those head cutted uh, deeply incised channels and making them meandering streams with a uh, healthy riparian uh, ecosystem buffer. We'll also be creating about eight acres of emergent wetlands. Uh, so we're making tributaries that look like that original picture that I showed you earlier look something like this. The conveyance elements we talked about, we have about 32 miles of pipeline, somewhere between 54 and 60 inches. A balancing reservoir somewhere between five and 10 acres, 
a pump station with a 45 MGD initial phase and an 80 MGD ultimate phase. So again, going back through these, we have the raw water pump station up here at the reservoir, 32 miles of pipeline that connects to a bouncing reservoir. Uh, we have the exist, we'll be doing some improvements to Irving's phase two, our booster pump station, uh, going through the, their pipeline and going to both the Harpool and being able to discharge into Lake Louisville and picking it up at, uh, by the, uh, uh, at our intake on Lake Louisville. Support facilities include our lake headquarters and administration facilities. It'll be located on the south edge of the lake on State Highway 34. It'll have lake administration and management. It'll have meeting facilities for the public. It'll have a visitor center uh, and other, it basically be our, our public interface for the project. And then next to the dam, we'll have a maintenance facility that will have all the dam, lake and pump station operations and maintenance activities. During a demolition, we have, like I said, about 7,500 acres within the lake actually inundated, and we'll be clearing some parts of that, substantial parts of that actually. Uh, we'll leave some for fish habitat, but the rest will be cleared for, uh, to make way for uh, boating and other navigation. We'll also be demolishing any existing structures, uh, removing fences and grading, some grading to remove navigational hazards. It's a pretty big program, so we got some program support. Uh, we're going to be soliciting a pro program quality management team that includes a, quali a program quality assurance laboratory. Uh, all of the QC lab, Q QC uh, testing will be done by labs employed by the contractors, but we'll have our own quality assurance laboratory. They'll be doing a verification testing on their, on their works. We're going to be augmenting our staff uh, for program support with specialty inspection, uh, construction management support, and miscellaneous engineering that we might need. And we'll also have program management infrastructure. Uh, and on that, we're actually uh, will be things like a program management information system, our uh, our office trailers, and such as that. So planning the delivery, how are we going to do it? Uh, we have to structure and procure design and construction contracts. We are managing the design and uh, managing the design and construction contracts. How we're going to finance the program? How we're going to optimize our cash flow? And finally, how are we going to establish a team that transitions to operations? So, so the answers require some thinking outside of the box, some new tools, and some new processes. So looking at how we're going to do this, uh, here's all the elements again. So starting out with roadways and bridges, uh, we're delivering that with a progressive design build model. We have selected Flatiron Construction as our design builder, Yutt Zollers as their designer. And our goal there is leveraging the design builder collaboration uh, and optimizing the design and allows for concurrent design, procurement and construction activities and our expected results are optimized construction costs and shortened schedule. So a couple of the examples that we're already seeing, we, we contracted with Flatiron uh, this last month, uh, August, and they're already optimizing the, the amount of fill. Uh, they're op optimizing the, the embankment versus structure part of the bridges. They're optimizing the spacing of the, of the vents so that we, uh, get the least cost for bents and beams. Uh, and they're also uh, looking at having some early uh, work packages to start the construction of the, of the piers and the bents and even buying the beams early before they complete the design or other, other elements of the project. The Leonhurst Dam is, uh, we're gonna do that with a pre-qualified bid. The prospective bidders will have to uh, play, uh, submit qualification of their relevant experience and financial capabilities, and those qual and those selected qualified will submit a hard bid. And our expected results are qualified uh, and financially stable contractors and highly competitive bids. What we're looking for there is a contractor that has both the financial capability and has experience to build a large earth fill dam. 
The support facilities will be designed bid-build. Uh, these are relatively small contracts and we will allow us for close interaction with the architects to meet our expected themes so that we have, we can meet our theme, architectural themes and meet our needs. We also get competitive bids. The conveyance, we have a general engineering consultant, LAN on board, and they're completing the system somewhat less than 30% design. Uh, they're helping us plan the delivery strategy and just a news flash for those that haven't heard it, we'll be soliciting a design pack, a designer for the pump station in the next uh, 20 to 30 days. Uh, and then we'll be later on next year uh, soliciting the remainder of the uh, of, the, of this package. Uh, expected results are by getting critical design issues addressed early and some professional expertise in selecting a path forward. And hopefully at the end we'll have a competitive process that meets our needs for all of the elements. The program support uh, is a combination of strategies. We're retaining firms for CM responsibilities. Friesen Nichols, our dam designer, will be doing the CM on the dam. We'll be soliciting a construction uh, engineering and inspection firm to help us monitor the construction on the roadways. We'll uh, have, uh, LAN will probably continue in a construction role on the conveyance. And then uh, the uh, other facilities will be addressing either with our own forces or we'll have contracted on those as well. The uh, most of the program uh, management aspect will be will be uh, by our team. Uh, we're, we'll have a upper trinity person as a construction manager, and they'll be managing all these various other roles. Oops. Uh, the last piece is clearing and demolition. We're going to be hiring, a, a retaining a designer to help us develop the scope of work, uh, develop our bid packages, and that gives us flexibility to adapt the scope to optimize opportunities for local and 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 H and hub contracting and also get competitive pricing. <clears throat> Aquatic mitigation is a different animal. We're using a full service provider or pay for success contract. Uh, the contractor will assume full responsibility for development, for implementing our mitigation plan. And that is through design, construction, maintenance, and monitoring all the way through the seven year monitoring period up until US Corps uh, Corps of Engineers acceptance. And basically our result there is transferring the risk for that to that full service provider and the unknowns, because uh, they there's a, a number of them that have understand that risk profile and can manage that risk. And it gives them sole, sole source responsibility. So we have to develop an, an infrastructure to manage the program. So the program will generate a large volume of documents, all requiring action. It requires communications between all these various delivery partners. It requires a need, needs a tool to manage budget and cash flow. And so our solution is a program management information system, which Jacobs is helping us deploy. Uh, also the program must have proactive communications with stakeholders and we're, we've retained a communications firm to help us with a, uh, develop and implement a communications plan. And the program staff is dispersed between multiple offices and we're out or deploying a robust IT infrastructure for connectivity. Financing the project, the project cost is estimated at 489 million and that includes all of the land, planning, permitting and construction. We've allocated another 85 million for risk allowance to date, we spent 74 million, so we need another $500 million. Does anybody, if anybody has that, I'll be happy to take a donation. But in all seriousness, uh, the Water Development Board, we've had a total of 84 million in existing debt with Water Development Board. They have committed to another 15 million, which we will receive in 2021. And in August, they approved another 413 million that, uh, uh, that will be funding the, the bulk of the construction and, and remainder of the design. That leaves about maybe 61 million for additional sources that we'll be seeking through uh, commercial paper and future bonds. But to optimize that cash flow, dealing with a, a cash flow of over $100 million a year, a little bit of variance in cash flow 
can make a lot of difference in either interest paid or interest earned. So our actual cash demand varies over the year. It does, we do have to have sufficient cash on hand to fund those demand variations. And we also need to optimize that so we can pay huge dividends, in either in interest, like I said, interest earned or interest not paid. So the contractors will be required to submit cash flow projections monthly. Uh, our debt is funded over, uh, actually on a yearly basis and our draw is based on a pr projected cash flow. And we'll be using uh, commercial paper to fund unexpected needs in between. The schedule, we started out actually before 2001, spent 17 years getting permits. We've been acquiring land for 15 years. We presently own about 14,500 of the 16,000 acres required for the project. Uh, and we'll start, we soon start acquiring easements for the right of way. Uh, we started out our design about uh, four years ago. We still got another three years to go on that. Uh, construction's anticipated to start to five years. We say filling three years, we're actually in the end of the day, we'll probably actually start drawing water out of that after about a year and a half of filling. The uh, freezing nickels analysis says the reservoir will fill anywhere between in, in one to seven years, depending on uh, the rainfalls. Okay, we got it built. What is, what can you, what's the future going to look like after we have it built? and what's the operating a new water supply look like. So initially right now, we've got a planning, design, and construction team that's focused on technical issues. We're addressing regulatory issues. We're ma managing complex construction in issues and coordinating with the community stakeholders. We're gonna have to transition to a, for, uh, a operations team that's focused on local relationships, coordinating with government partners, operating and maintaining the infrastructure and dealing with public interest and concerns, uh, primarily from a recreational standpoint. So our strategies are to deploy a staff with appropriate qualifications, uh, consider future needs, but let the qualifications for the immediate need drive. We'll use contracted staff for non-permanent needs, and where appropriate, we will transition staff to operation because that staff will have a a tremendous baseline knowledge of what was built and why it was built. So, but also Rockcroft High will be more than a water supply. So our board has adopted the vision you see there at the top. Lovecraft Hall is a special place, a natural place, a quiet place, a hospitable place, both for people and the environment, assuring a reliable water supply for generations to come. So looking at two aspects of it, recreation on the lake, and land use beyond the borders of the lake uh, are two different jurisdictions almost, or really is two different jurisdictions. Recreation will be our jurisdiction. Uh, we own the lake as well as, well as the top, the, the, up to elevation 560 or 100 foot from the lake shore, whichever is greater. Uh, so we will be, be developing a land and shoreline use plan and from that a land, lake and shoreline management plan which will outline how we will make, what, we're, what we will allow to happen on the lake and how we will uh, govern what happens on the lake. And we'll be exploring partnerships and opportunities for lake recreation amenities. Beyond our, what we own is gonna be the jurisdiction of Fannin County and Ladonia. Uh, legislation, there's legislation that grants Fannin County zoning authority within one mile of the lake and they will be exercising that authority and developing a zoning plan similar to what they did on Bodar, but it will be its, its own unique plan for Lake Ralph Hall. The city, the city will have zoning jurisdiction within its city limits and they will exercise their own uh, zoning uh, regulations up to the lake there. So with that, developing new water supply. We started this, we didn't want to bark up the wrong tree. We didn't want the whole thing to go to hell in a handbasket, even though sometimes we thought it would. And we sure didn't want to lay an egg, but today uh, move, we're moving forward with Lake Ralph Hall, a reliable water supply. Uh, Upper Trinity is committed to a reliable long-term water supply that is adequate for the district service area. So I want to end this with this picture right here, and there's a story behind this picture. 
is I often tell people what has happened in my life since I started working on Lake Ralph Hall. And it ends with this, these five beautiful children here, but it started out with my, I have two sons, as was mentioned, they both graduated from high school. This all happened since I started working on it. Both graduated from high school. Between them earned three college degrees and the one with two degrees took him seven years to get his first one. They uh, have gotten married and together had these five grandchildren, the oldest of which is, is Addison on the left, who will be eight in January. Next to her is her sister, Hannah, who will be uh, six in March. And the little one there is Caroline, who will be two in December. And going further to the right, we have Lorelai, who will be seven in March. Following with Preston, the one grandson, who will be uh, four in January. It's a wonder that I remember all of that. So with that, I'll turn it back to you guys for questions. Hi, Ed. This is Nancy Klein. I was going to ask you, why would Flower Mound contest the permit? Uh, a lot of it was, they were the most uh, pervasive contestant. Uh, I'll say this, and probably 75% of the testimony, uh, opposing testimony came from them. Uh, and it was partly a political answer and partly uh, economic is they didn't feel like that they uh, wanted to have the project in their rate structure. Because y'all supply water to Flower Mountain, correctly? We do, yeah. As a matter of fact, they're our biggest customer. But, but Nancy, due to the unique aspects of our contract with Dallas, uh, Dallas is obligated to supply us sufficient raw water to meet the, the needs of 10 uh, named cities and Flower Mound is one of those named cities. So we don't need another supply to, to supply Flower Mound. But we do all of our other customers. And, and it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a very complicated issue, but uh, we're, about, we're past that now. Hey Ed, this is uh, Carlos Padarama. Um, you know, it's not every day that you hear about a, about a new lake being developed, so um, it's pretty cool you've been involved through the whole process. Um, you mentioned aquatic mitigation as part of the plan for getting the lake um, constructed and developed. For those like me that don't have a lot of experience in this field, um, could you kind of expand on what that is and what it entails? So aquatic mitigation is uh, all of the aquatic resources that the lake impacts, uh, we have to mitigate that so that there is a no net impact, a zero net impact to aquatic resources. And what is unique is, is you have to mitigate for resources in kind, because obviously we're building a great big lake here, and you would think that that would be uh, sufficient to mitigate for all the streams, but we have to mitigate stream for streams. And there's some uh, 500,000 linear feet of streams that we impact. And how we calculated the mitigation requirement, we used a functional assessment, which basically measured the, the condition of the stream. And these streams were so highly degraded that we didn't have to measure, we didn't have to, we had to only uh, mitigate the function so it's not foot per foot, it was function for function. So the numbers are we have to, and, and it, there's a, a, a protocol for measuring, we have to mitigate 489 functional credit units. Uh, so, and we have to do that by creating new streams that have a higher function than the existing streams. And that, those have to be outside of it. So basically we're replacing the loss of stream function within the impoundment of the reservoir. And do you have an area where that where that occurs? Is that like downstream of the dam or is that, I know you had some there's, area shape, go ahead. 
Sorry. Yeah, there's an area. Let me go backwards here. So these three brown areas are where our aquatic mitigation is. Ed, this is uh, Jonathan Brower. Thanks again for coming to speak to us. Uh, you mentioned, I believe, a, an existing 84-inch uh, line that was not going to have to be uh, upsized or anything. Was that oversized initially in design, or how did it just happen to have capacity? Actually, it's a 72-inch. It's a and yes, uh, when Irving built that pipeline back in the early 2000s, they took, they took uh, alternative bids for, they needed a 66 inch pipeline, but they took an alternative bid for 72. And the pricing of that was very favorable. So they went on and upsized the line. And between that and the pressure class, uh, we, we can actually just by upgrading the pumps, uh, push more water through that same pipe. So it's a matter of there, there's b between the with oxygen to pressure class, we can push more water. So we're basically upgrading the pumps to get up to the most we can through that pipe. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, and I was going to ask about what kind of development are the, is the county and the city envisioning around the lake? That is yet to be known. Uh, the, the county will be probably in the next, uh, Probably the next year undergoing their uh, zoning study, uh, zoning plan, developing their plan, which will answer that question. So right now it's, it's yet to be known, but it, 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 the details of it wouldn't be, it's, it's hard to know and what the regulations are gonna be, but you know, it's obviously probably gonna be housing. Hey Ed, does that uh, $489 million construction cost, does that include, um, you know, the pipeline and relocating the roadways? Is that an all-inclusive number? It, yeah, it includes all the construction, all of the land, all of the cost for the planning uh, and permitting. It, you know, that, that's, that's everything. Ed, we want to thank you for being willing to speak to us today. It was great to learn about the Lake Ralph Hall project. It's been a long time in the process and I'm glad to see that it's getting underway and will soon be finished. If you have any additional questions you wanna ask our speaker today, please put those in the comments section and we'll send those to him and then send you the response. This month, there will not be any Institute technical seminars, but we will have a history and heritage presentation by Richard Furlong on the world's tallest skyscrapers. A link to it will be shown below and will be included in the meeting email and the social media blast. We will be having a virtual meeting for the remainder of the calendar year. Hopefully in 2021, we can meet back in person. Next month's meeting is scheduled for October 12th. We will have the installation of the new officers and a great presentation. You'll see a link below the presentation in the description, which will take you to a Google form. This is how we'll know who to send the PDH certificate to. On the form, there's a code that you will need to type in to receive the certificate. The code is Ralph Hall. If you have any trouble, please let us know at info at dallasase.org or in any of our social media platforms. The link will remain active till the end of September. Again, the code is Ralph Hall. In the end, I couldn't do it on my own. It's a team effort. So thanks to all those who have helped put this meeting on. Thank you for attending the virtual Dallas branch meeting and I hope you have a great week. With that, I adjourn the September meeting. Thanks for joining us.